a lot of the founders of geology were actually theologians. And, you know, they tended to cast their interpretations within the biblical framework. And a they lot were of using the, what they had. Yeah, they were using what they had. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and they would look at evidence in the field and think, well, gosh, look at all this, these huge gravel deposits here. How did they get there? Well, must have been giant flood. Well, that's evidence of Noah's flood. And so that kind of became sort of the dominant idea in the 19th century that you're looking at this evidence in the, in the landscapes that suggests catastrophic flooding. And then as the 19th century gets on, you have a different school that arises, you know, the Lyellian school, Charles Lyell, who took the work of, of James Hutton and, and Playfair and basically cast it into a dogma. Uh, which he called uniformitarianism, and this dogma became the 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 the, the fundamental uh, cornerstone, if you will, of academic geology. Because in the early to mid nineteenth century, geology was not an academic scientific discipline, and it only became that towards the end of the nineteenth century, where 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 universities would actually begin to have geology departments and so on. When they did that, they basically took on a, a strict uniformitarian interpretation of earth history because being scientific they were going to you know basically evolve past all the the biblical stuff and and there was a, a a component of biblical literalism and you know the idea amongst so many of the the biblical literalists was the earth is you know only five or six thousand years old which of course is is not the case but, but yeah so all of this was kind of lumped together and they thought well we, we're going to move beyond that we're scientists we're going to dispense with you know, biblical interpretations. And so anybody who came along and proposed, well, wait a minute, some of this evidence you're talking about, some of this evidence here really does look like it was created by huge floods. Well, they were ignored or dismissed. That's why when, when uh, geologist J. Harlan Bretz came along in the early 1920s and proposed that the so-called channeled scab lands of eastern Washington were produced by gigantic floods, he was just dismissed out of hand, literally for a quarter of a century. But was there was there a counter arguing to how they were how they were uh, made, or was oh, yeah, it just yeah, dismissed? Yeah. Well, it was mostly dismissed, and the attempts to to um, put out a, a counter argument basically attempted to explain it in terms as a result of more gradual, prolonged uh, processes. But you know, Bretz was very very dogged in his uh, you know field research, and and he spent a couple of decades. Uh, exhaustively documenting the evidence. And when you pull it all together, it just, it doesn't give much room for any other interpretation mm -hmm. other than gigantic catastrophic floods. And, and one of the, one of the, his preeminent critics was a man, was a geologist named James Galuli. And James Galuli sort of spearheaded the effort to discredit Brett's. And there's a famous story about where James Galuli organized this conference in Washington, D.C. They invited uh, Harlan Bretz, and the idea was that they were going to, you know, ostensibly give him a fair hearing. But what, we're, what it really was was a, 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 an assassination attempt. They were basically going to band together and suppress this heresy. And James Galuli was the geologist who essentially spearheaded this effort to once and for all Let's do away with this heresy of catastrophic flooding and all of its implications. So then what happened was at that meeting, there was another geologist named J.T. Pardee, who was with the U.S. Geological Survey, and he had been studying mountain valleys in western Montana where he found evidence of gigantic b masses of water. Well, that meeting was seminal because eventually – J.T. Pardee's work and J. Harlan Bretz's work came together. And as we go along here, I can pull up some slides to show you the kind of things that, that Pardee was looking at. And see, and most of the critics, and I, and I need to emphasize this, to a man, the critics of J. Harlan Bretz had never actually gone out in the field and seen this evidence firsthand, right? Naturally. Right. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw Why it on Netflix. Why is that such a common theme? <laughs> finally, finally enough of them. And, and, you know, as time goes on, you know, after 25 or 30 years, there was new generations of, of young geologists coming up who were a little bit more open to alternate interpretations. So eventually a field expedition was organized out to the Channel Scablands, and James Galuli was part of that. 
and they spent a week touring touring the region and and you're looking at a at a at a, at a whole suite of these geological features like um extinct cataracts which i'll show you some photographs of here shortly um sure gigantic boulders that that are were not see a lot of gigantic boulders had been found previously and and associated with with the ice mass that the ice transported these glacier with these erratic boulders they're called erratic because it might be a boulder that is one composition yet the bedrock there's a t totally different kind of of rock like like the ones you find in maine where i grew up exactly like the ones yep. you find in maine but here was the problem here are these gigantic erratics that are 50 100 200 miles beyond the glacier margin so they weren't deposited by the glaciers themselves see so you've got these you've got these um coolies which are these big sheer cut sheer walled uh canyons you've got these recessional cataracts um you've got the huge gravel deposits that form these gravel trains that might be two or three miles long and rather than gravel like we think of the composition of these things might be millions of boulders that are three four five six ten feet even 20 feet in diameter um, you have fields of these gigantic current ripples and again i'm gonna we'll pull up some slides and look at this stuff so it's like when you go in the field and you see this whole suite of stuff isolated one particular thing you might be able to explain it away and that was how that was the approach you know you take one phenomena and mm -hmm. Isolate it from the rest of it, and you come up with an explanation of yeah, how that picking. boulder <laughs> ended up there. But when you put it all yeah. together, there's really no other explanation. So, getting back to James Galuli, they spent a week out in the field. They were walking around looking at all of this stuff, and the the last day they were at a place called Palouse Falls, which is in southeastern Washington, which is a pretty amazing, big bowl shaped uh, cataract feature. Yeah, and and the 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 Palouse River that flows through there now is just a tiny little ribbon, but you've got this massive cataract, right? And this landscape, which for miles around has just been desecrated by these tremendous shear forces of the, of the moving water. So the, as the story goes, th this was the final stop on the last day of their trip. And James Galuli walked away from the group and he was standing there looking into this, this big 400 foot deep, you know, basin in the ground with this little waterfall and said, stood there looking at that for a long time and finally walked back to the group and said, how could I have been so wrong? <laughs> and you got no, it's good that he got there. there though. Yeah. It's good that he got there and see, here's the thing. I mean, Brett's was proposing an extremely radical idea. So yeah, give it your best shot. Do the best you can to do everything to discredit it. But at exactly. the end, it stood on its own two feet. And that was, at that point and after that, the geological community began to accept that these floods were real. 